We saw in part 11 that evolution is an attack on God. And we saw in part 12 that the Nobel Prize winner, George Wald, said he believes in evolution even though he knows that it is disproved by science because he refuses to believe in God. Today there are a number of campaigning atheists preaching evolution as an open challenge to God. Perhaps the best known at the moment is Richard Dawkins. As with George Wald, he has to deny what science has found to be true. I'd like to look at Dawkins' claim in the next few episodes. For those who are not familiar with his stand, we'll look at a typical performance in a video uploaded to YouTube by Idea City 07. Much of what he confidently proclaims is not true, but this is probably not because he deliberately intends to lie. I think it's a consequence of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. They did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved, and for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Very clearly, Dawkins has not received the love of the truth that he might be saved. So if God has sent him a strong delusion, he probably sincerely believes the lies that he preaches. And there's no chance of him seeing the truth until he does embrace God's truth, so God could remove his strong delusion. That was certainly the case with me when I was an atheist. In this snippet, he makes his oft-repeated claim that the origin of life is ludicrously improbable. But that's no problem, because there are so many opportunities for evolution on billions of planets in billions of galaxies. There are a billion, billion galaxies and a plausible number of planets. Think of the implications of that. The fact that there are so many planets in the universe, so many, more, more generally, so many opportunities for life to have originated, entitles us, if we need it, to postulate a theory of the origin of life which is just vanishingly, ludicrously improbable. In the next snippet, he claims that Hoyle's analysis, showing the utter implausibility of life from non-life, is not valid because evolution has a solution. Fred Hoyle expressed it in his famous misunderstanding of natural selection, the great Boeing 747 example. He said um, to, to believe that life could be formed uh, by Darwinian processes is equivalent to believing that a hurricane could blow through a junkyard and have the luck to assemble a Boeing 747. And that is a, an eloquent statement of the great creationist misunderstanding, which is that Darwinian evolution is a matter of chance. Of course it isn't, it's a matter of gradual cumulative natural selection, and the stress is on the word cumulative. In the next snippet, he claims that the origin of life is just a chemistry problem, and all that's needed is a plausible chemical scenario which chemists are working on. Now, the Darwinian theory works beautifully once life gets started, but there may be a gap at the beginning which gives people problems. What about the origin of life? What about that first step that kick-starts the evolutionary process? Chemists are working on it. It's a, it's a chemical problem. It's a matter for chemists. Chemists are working on it, and um, obviously it's very hard to do because it happened a long time ago under very different conditions, and so um, all we can hope for is some kind of plausibility argument backed up by theoretical models. We'll see that all these claims are untrue or untenable, but before we can do that, we need to look at what probability and improbability are. The Russian expert, Emil Borel, stated that one chance in 10 to the power 50 has a zero probability of ever happening, and even that gives it the benefit of the doubt. Well, what does 10 to the power 50, or any other number, mean? 
Ten to any number is one with that number of zeros after it. So ten to the power fifty is one followed by fifty zeros. It's much easier to use the shorthand ten to the fifty than writing out all those zeros. Mathematicians tend to look at the same thing in a slightly different way. Rather than saying one chance in ten, for example, they would usually say the probability is one divided by ten, which is one over ten, which is naught point one, which is one with the decimal point moved one place to the left. It's written with the shorthand ten to the minus one. So a probability of ten to the power of any negative number is a probability of one with the decimal point moved that same number of places to the left. Odds of one chance in ten to the power fifty is the same as the probability of ten to the power minus fifty, which is shorthand for zero point forty nine zeros one. One way of getting an idea. Of such huge numbers is to consider a national lottery. Not all lotteries are exactly the same, but the chance of any particular ticket winning is usually about one chance in ten to the power seven. In other words, the probability of winning is about ten to the minus seven. The chance of buying one ticket each week and winning twice in a row. Is one chance in ten to the seven multiplied by ten to the seven, which equals ten to the power seven plus seven, which is ten to the power fourteen. The chance of winning every week for a month is ten to the power seven times four, which is ten to the power twenty-eight. There have been people who've won a national lottery more than once. By buying every possible number when the jackpot was worth more than the cost of the tickets, but nobody's ever won twice in a row buying just one ticket each time. So the chance of winning twice in a row, ten to the minus fourteen, is little more than a pipe dream. We can see why Borel said, "One chance in ten to the fifty has a zero probability of happening." It's almost the chance of buying one lottery ticket every week and winning seven weeks in a row, as Borel said. It's not going to happen. These improbabilities are tame, almost trivial in comparison with those facing evolution. They show why Hoyle said the possibility of life happening by chance is nonsense of a high order. We can see why even Richard Dawkins admitted that the possibility is ludicrously improbable. His attempt to talk his way around it is just bluff. Let's look at that next time. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project. You're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.